Um, I knew we can count with Dr. Mavi. He just came running from the airport and he is going to be giving his lecture next. Uh, his lecture is entitled Complications of Open Pancreas Surgery, Current Data. Well, thanks. It's great to be in Baltimore and not in Chicago. Um, luckily, none of you were in Chicago in the rainstorm and the lightning. Um, I was speaking a second ago that I feel like I'm kind of uh, a little bit out of my element here talking about open surgery in, uh, at Sages, so uh, please uh, be gentle with me. Um, but my task was to talk about open pancreas surgery, and, and I'm going to sort of try to frame this issue a little bit of what Craig talked about and try to uh, sort of frame the issue of who should be doing this kind of uh, laparoscopic resections of pancreas, uh, uh, especially the head of the pancreas, and where does it actually fit, and is there really any data? Um, and I'm going to refute a little bit of what Craig said, and I realize I'm here in, uh, with the world's experts in this disease, so uh, it gives me a little bit of pause. So first, my disclosures, I um, own part of these companies that lose money continuously and have no medical devices. So pancreas surgery. Um, the, this is what I, I, just to frame this, these are the issues with open pancreas surgery, and they're the same with laparoscopic pancreas surgery. Uh, pancreatic leaks, which I'll talk about. Law, late diabetes, and I actually tried to go through the literature and figure out what the risk of late diabetes is. I, I can't find it. It doesn't exist. It would be a great study to go back to as we see our patients living longer after pancreatic surgery. Uh, hernias, uh, again, um, a late complication, uh, but certainly something that we end up dealing with, especially in patients with chronic pancreatitis and benign disease. And this uh, thing Craig talked a little bit about, failure to thrive, inability to receive adjuvant therapy. Uh, I look at that as kind of a uh, you've lost a lot of the benefits of your pancreatic cancer operation if your patient doesn't get better for six months and their survival is a year. And I, I think even if you look beyond adjuvant therapy, which does have some impact on survival, the real quality of life issues are something that have been a little bit hard to quantitate. So how do you prevent leaks? Um, this is uh, sort of a straightforward list of uh, different ways to do anastomoses. Some of these are relatively easy to do open or laparoscopic, some are not. Um, do you sew the duct to the mucosa? Do you hook the pancreas to the stomach? Do you invaginate it? Um, do you stent it? Do you use postoperative octreotide? And I would say the data on all these, and I, I actually went back and reviewed this again, is you can't. So some people are going to leak, some are not. We can talk a little bit about which patients might be more prone to leak based on really pancreatic texture and um, what they were like pre-op, but it, it really doesn't matter from my surgical standpoint because whoever shows up to have their pancreas taken out, you've you got to deal with that patient. You can't hope that there's somebody different. So our, our leak rate is about 20% in our series. I think most national series, when they really look at these and use the uh, uh, classification system, um, suggest that that's about the same. So I really don't think you can prevent a leak, and we certainly counsel all of our patients that, the, that this is the risk of this operation, and we expect leaks. Um, how do you define these? Um, I thought I'd go through this just a, a touch and talk about grade and how do you treat leaks, and then talk a little bit about the differences between open and um, laparoscopic surgery. So um, grades of leaks. A leak is pretty obvious. I mean, if you have pancreatic rich fluid coming out in a patient uh, postoperatively after a pancreatic resection, it's a leak. Um, these are the grades of leaks, and this is really what matters. Most of the leaks that we see are grade A leaks, meaning the patient's fine. You know, they're just sitting there in the drain is putting out pancreatic fluid, and those patients we just give food to and send them home, and they do great, and after about four or five weeks, they're well, and we take the drain out. The Grade B and C leaks are really problematic, and um, the mantra that I've always used is that if somebody has a pancreatic leak, the last thing in the entire world you want to do is operate on them and try to fix the leak. But uh, as you can see, the grade C leaks are patients that you really can't uh, control their sepsis that require reoperation, and uh, or patients that die. We see very few grade C leaks anymore, and um, of our last three years of you know, doing about 120 of these a year, we haven't actually reoperated on anybody. So it's a relatively rare event. And there's, there's a little bit of a literature on rescue, which is um, something that I think big, uh, the, the, that's the advantage of doing lots of pancreatic surgery in big centers is that you're used to people that are having leaks and which ones of them you can save and which ones you can't. 
And these are ways to treat leaks. You can treat patients with antibiotics, which typically doesn't work. Uh, you can reoperate on them. If you, uh, the series from the World Journal of Surgery um, from a few years ago showed a 65% mortality when they reoperated on somebody. And they're reoperating on desperately ill people with sepsis or bleeding, so not shocking. There's a really interesting report that was published uh, in JOGS last year where they looked at, where they reoperated on people with grade B and C leaks. And um, instead of doing a pancreatectomy with all this morbidity, they actually just put a stent in the pancreatic duct and sewed up the hole on the other side, drained it widely, and they actually were able to salvage all those patients. And the ones that they did a pancreatectomy on, they salvaged only half of them. So it's, it's a really interesting study, um, and the, the technique is really nicely described. But what they do is they go in and find the, the pancreas has fallen apart, put a tube in the uh, pancreatic duct, uh, sew it in as best they can, and drain it widely, and make no attempt to reconstruct it. And then after uh, sepsis is cleared, and six to eight weeks later, sometimes six months later, they go back and reconnect the uh, pancreas, and, all, and none of those have leaked because of all the scarring there. But a really nice report, and really, only thing I can really find on this issue. So what are the modifiable risk factors? I'm going to get a little bit into sort of open versus laparoscopic surgery here. So these are the things you can do as a surgeon to affect the patient. Uh, you obviously can't do anything about the pancreas. The pancreas is what it is. The tumor is what it is. But you can reconstruct it differently. The data I showed earlier really shows there's really no impact of that. You can't change your leak rate based on reconstruction. The morbidity and mortality are the same. Uh, operative time is something that um, is clearly longer in laparoscopic surgery. Um, kind of a big issue, I think. Stents don't seem to make any difference. Um, antibiotics probably don't matter. Octreotide doesn't make any difference. So the really difference you can make as a surgeon is how long does the operation take and how do you do the reconstruction? And what do we not know? Um, and I'm going to be a little bit of a curmudgeon here, which I'm not quite sure how I fell into the curmudgeon rule. I don't feel that old. But um, anyway, does this really improve outcome? To, to me, outcome means that the patient's quality of life is better or they live longer. I mean, those are the outcomes that really matter in pancreatic cancer. Um, does it change the hernia rates? Um, and does this really make a difference? It probably does. I mean, most of the data would suggest that if you do an open operation, your hernia rate's higher. Not shocking. Does MIS pancreatectomy improve survival? There's no data for this at all. And uh, I think, I suspect the answer is going to be it doesn't. It doesn't matter. Um, do you get to adjuvant therapy earlier? I think the two reports that were just shown so that that's probably true. You probably do get to adjuvant therapy earlier. Um, some of the reports are difficult to discern because they're selecting which patients have which type of surgical procedure, and that's probably not a fair comparison. And I think the bottom point is really the one that matters in patients with pancreatic cancer. What's their quality of life like? What's their long-term quality of life? Not, not what it's like in the first week after their pancreatectomy or the first month, but what's it like at six months and a year? And the Hopkins group has done a lot of nice work on this, an open pancreatectomy, and it, it after about six months is better than it was before they had their operation. I'm going to show, eh, this doesn't project well. I'll make two points about this table. Um, let's see if I can make this light come on. That's okay. I'll talk about it. So this is a, a, a paper that was, um, that was, it's looking at factors influencing readmission. So the, the top line on this is uh, wound infection. So that matters a lot. And the wound infection rate is going to be significantly higher in patients that have open pancreatectomy. So that's a big deal, I think. And that's a giant advantage of uh, laparoscopic pancreatectomy is the wound infection rate. Everything else looks about the same. If you look at this uh, slide, which is from the same paper, and it's, it's really a meta-analysis of other things, and you look at the uh, fifth, fourth column over and see all those p-values that start to be positive, the one that I really want to highlight is that the, the length of time you stay in the OR affects readmission rates, it affects complication rates, and it probably affects uh, uh, perioperative mortality. So I think you're playing these two things against each other a little bit. You're, you're doing a longer operation that has a lower wound complication rate, but there's a little bit of data, not just in pancreatic cancer, but in other types of cancer, that the longer the operation persists, it, it probably has something to do with uh, other factors, but even in a multivariate analysis, it probably matters how long you spend in the operating room doing these surgical procedures. So it's just a little bit of a note of caution before everyone goes down this path. My second note of caution is that um, 
to do good laparoscopic pancreatic surgery, you have to do volume. You can't do one every six months or a year. Um, I, th I think we do enough volume of distal pancreatectomies at most pancreatic centers to, to be effective at that and good at it. Um, if, if you look at, I, I, my note of caution to MIS surgeons is I wouldn't just jump into doing laparoscopic Whipples, that it uh, sounds like a good idea, it sounds cool, it's fun, but these guys are doing them every day and you can't really take their data and use it to set up a practice in this. I just think it's, it's not exactly the right thing to do. And I think before embarking on this, and I've heard Craig talk about this a little bit, is that before he did his first laparoscopic Whipple, he spent six months in the dog lab doing laparoscopy on dogs until he felt completely comfortable doing intracorporeal suturing to a pancreatic duct. Well, that's a lot of time, it's a lot of effort, it, it takes big volume, and I, I guess my note of caution is this is probably not for everyone. So thank you for uh, inviting me.